Chapter 3 Equity In the previous chapter, we learnt about the various forms of debt funding that can be employed by a business. Companies can also use equity as a means of funding their operations. In its most basic form, equity involves a company raising funding from investors, where the investors receive a portion of ownership in the company in return for the funds invested. In this chapter, we will learn a methodology for estimating the cost of equity funding on a company's balance sheet called the Capital Asset Pricing Methodology, or CAPM. We will then use the CAPM, along with the cost of debt facilities on a company's balance sheet, in order to calculate the total cost of the company's overall funding structure, the Weighted Average Cost of Capital, or WAC. The Capital Asset Pricing Methodology and Weighted Average Cost of Capital the Capital Asset Pricing Methodology, or CAPM, is a method of determining the rate of return on an asset, usually a company share, based on the asset's risk profile. The CAPM formula is given by the risk-free rate of interest in the economy plus a market risk premium, and we will see how that is calculated. Beta. The beta coefficient measures the correlation between the performance of the asset in question and the performance of the market. If the asset in question has a positive value of beta, then the asset would appreciate in value if the market appreciates in value. Assets with a negative beta move in the opposite direction to market movements. Theoretically, gold is said to have a negative beta because in bear markets, and during times of uncertainty, the value of gold increases as other assets in the market devalue. Thus, gold is used to hedge against inflation and recession. In general, assets with low or negative beta values are used as hedging tools, as they don't move directly in line with the market and therefore reduce the risk of a portfolio containing such assets. A beta greater than 1 indicates an asset that is more volatile than the market. Such assets would experience larger gains than the market during times of economic growth. However, they would lose value quicker than the market in times of economic decline. An asset with a beta of zero would perform the same way regardless of how the market performs, and is therefore risk-free. Government-backed securities theoretically have a zero beta since governments can always print more money in order to pay their contractual capital and interest obligations, regardless of how the economy performs. Therefore, government-backed securities have a zero beta and yield the risk-free rate of interest. The beta coefficient is given by measuring the covariance between the return on the asset and the return on the market and dividing that by the variance of the returns on the market. It's calculated by measuring the historical returns made on the asset in question and comparing these returns with historical returns seen on the market. The expected market rate of return. The expected market rate of return cannot be determined in a completely objective and scientific manner. There are four main sources of information one can look at in order to determine their view on the expected market rate of return. Historical market returns. This methodology is objective, as history is fact. However, how far back one would look is subjective. Looking only at recent history could paint a misleading picture of how the market would generally perform. This is true especially in the period immediately following a market disruption, for example. However, taking a longer history into account could include outdated and irrelevant information. Therefore, the choice of historical period should take historical events into account and should exclude any history beyond which the world would be a completely different place to what it is today. So, Sound judgment should be applied when determining the historical period to look at when determining the expected market rate of return using this method. Forward-looking market returns. 
In order to estimate the market return using a forward-looking method, one would need to find the internal rate of return that equates the value of a market index today with the expected cash flows from that market index in the future. The estimations of dividend yield and growth of the index can be found by putting together an analyst consensus across the market. This IRR would change as the value of the index changes from day to day and is thought to be the most accurate and dynamic measure for the market rate of return by some commentators. Market sentiment. This is the overall business confidence of investors in the economy today and going forward. If investors were confident that the economy would experience positive growth in the future, they would expect higher rates of return on their capital than if they were to be more pessimistic about the economic outlook. Thus, the more optimistic view of the market, the higher the expected market rate of return would be. Investor-specific hurdle rates. This is the most subjective measure, but the most influential one. Asset managers and hedge funds would have previously communicated a minimum rate of return to their investors. Their job now would be to place those funds in investments that would meet or exceed these minimum return thresholds. Any assets offering returns below their investment targets would not receive any capital investment. Due to the size of the asset management, pension fund, mutual fund, and hedge fund capital base, these targets play an important role in influencing the dividend yields or equity values of companies in the economy. The higher the industry-wide hurdle rates communicated by firms, the higher the expected market rate of return would be. The expected market rate of return can differ from one investor to another and can cause material differences in calculation of cost of capital for the same company, depending on which method is used. It is therefore important that one always states any assumptions made in their calculations when communicating their analyses to their colleagues or other stakeholders in the company. Putting it all together, a company can evaluate the required return on investment on its shares by using the CAPM formula. This required return on investment is the company's cost of equity, or cost of raising capital by selling shares to the public. The Weighted Average Cost of Capital The Weighted Average Cost of Capital, or WAC, is a measure of how expensive a company's mix of debt and equity is. When companies buy assets, they usually do so by using a combination of retained cash, debt, and equity. Retained cash carries zero cost to the company, as the company does not need to pay any external parties interest or dividends on that cash. Debt and equity, however, do carry a cost, as the providers of these types of capital require a return on their investment. The cost of debt is easy to ascertain. It's just the interest rate charged by the lender on the debt. The cost of equity can be determined by the CAPM formula we saw earlier in this section. The WAC will be the overall cost of the capital employed by a company, where we take the weighted average of the cost of debt and the cost of equity and determine the overall average cost to the company of funding the assets it employs. The WAC is given by the formula below. The WAC formula shows the weighted average of the cost of equity and debt respectively, weighted by the proportion of the company's capital that is funded by equity and debt respectively. It can be seen that the debt weighting is further reduced by a factor of 1 minus the tax percentage, reflecting the fact that interest on debt is tax deductible. The WAC is useful to treasury managers in assessing the optimal mix of debt and equity on their balance sheets. If a firm is majority funded using equity and the cost of equity is higher than the cost of debt, then it would be advantageous for the company to replace a portion of its equity with debt funding, thus lowering its WAC.
This can be achieved via the company raising debt and reducing the amount of its issued share capital via a share buyback. The opposite will also be true in the case where equity markets were very liquid and the cost of equity was lower than the cost of debt. In such case, a company could issue more shares, raise equity capital, and then repay its debt with the proceeds, thus lowering its weighted average cost of capital.